The following podcast contains strong language, like what the actual fuck. Scarecrow Festival is like the most important day of the year. Daft cow. This is just ridiculous. What the actual fuck. Hey, what the actual fuckers, and welcome to WTAF of This Country podcast. Now, first, he's the man who's just been upset by Arthur. Arthur apparently said crows belong in a field, not on a This Country podcast, and now we need to turn his frown upside down. It's Neil. Hello, Pav, and I'm going to give him a right brick in. <laughs> 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 right now our super fan guest is a journalist and deputy arts editor of the i newspaper and in a time where everything is going batshit crazy with all that's going on in the world let's chat with the one and only sarah carson hello sarah hiya <laughs> <laughs> so, um as we're recording this it's the what is it is it the 4th of november it is 2020 yeah. and uh it's safe to say there's a lots of weird shit going on um so I'm, I'm assuming as you work in the newspaper industry it's been quite uh, a torrid time for you in the last i would say four years probably <laughs> <laughs> well yes but um i'm quite lucky in that doing arts you sort of sidestep the new stuff so you can kind of be in the room when there's something exciting going on but you get to go away and do uh, cover the slightly more fun things we said that there was no room to be in today so i was just sort of uh, trying to trying to spy on the news lists and news conference to see what was going on has it been quite challenging in the lockdown to get the stories that you would like to have got in the arts yeah definitely i mean we sort of we would tend to plan weeks and weeks ahead so sort of by march everything that we had for the next month kind of had to be scrapped because you know theater shows weren't on albums were delayed films weren't released so um, yeah we had to be <laughs> quite creative about what we were trying to do but the good thing was um as time went on obviously people can't leave their houses so it's all of a sudden it became a bit easier to get interviews with people who are usually flying around the globe and now just sat at home you know doing mm. sort of concerts on zoom mm. we did we found that that we managed to get hold of in the interviews with guests that we would never have got uh, normally because we know that they're at home they're not doing anything so they haven't got an excuse this time um, yeah, so, so we will talk about obviously all the stuff that is going on with the lockdown and um covid and stuff but this country how did you find out about it originally were you a fan right from the very start yes i was um i actually found out about it because um it was i'm, I'm part of a, uh, a facebook group which was once tiny and is now absolutely huge and i think i've left it which was devoted to the office and um, I remember there were trailers from BBC Three just shared on there because everybody was saying it was a rip off of um, of what's his face Gareth. Gareth. Mm. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. So um, I remember seeing those, and then it hadn't come out yet, but people were just talking about it, and then I watched it and was obsessed. And it's nothing, you know. You can, it's, it's not a copy of The Office, thankfully, mm -hmm. which came pretty clear within about thirty seconds. But um, yeah, that's how I found it. So right. what was it that you fell in love with, Sarah? Um, well, there's a lot of things now, but obviously by this point I've watched it all about 12 times. But I think the thing that m I most loved at the very <laughs> beginning was um, how it uses detail, just like constant detail, really specific references to mad things like... Um, a Cadbury's fuse bar or baby Oleg or what else is there like holly oaks just constantly these things that you never think about or like the queen's nose just mm. they they pop into your brain and you i think you feel attached quite quickly when somebody remembers the same things you do um and also it's really funny mm. well there is like, that yeah <laughs> gift, gift gaff is another one <laughs> yeah you can imagine that they look at right let's look at all of the phone providers and which one is the funniest one to say gift gaff we'll choose gift gaff <laughs> It's that there's, there are certain things I find now that um, you think, well, that's a this country word or that's a this country product now that they would just, they would use. So when you, when you started watching it, 
and obviously you work in like, as a journalist in arts and stuff was there a buzz about it from the very start in your sort of day-to-day -day job was it something like people that you work with are going are you are you watching this well that was me trying to get everybody else to watch oh, right. it so <laughs> um but i actually ended up becoming really good friends with people at other newspapers or other magazines through this one show because nobody really had caught on just yet so there were about four or five of us at different places all really trying to kind of bang the drum um but within our own workplaces other people hadn't cottoned on so it was really nice actually because you sort of get to know I, you sort of become closer friends with people over this weird show and now I can't remember that that's why we first sort of went out for a drink but it was it would have been like one of us tweeted about it the other jumps on and says oh my god and um yeah so I would say it's definitely not been it, at the very beginning I feel like I was I was trying to find the drum but it took a while before other people started listening at work anyway. This is mm. when I worked, I didn't, I worked somewhere else at that time. Mm. Right, right. So do you, because you were sort of there from the start banging the drum, do you have a little bit of, because we've, I feel this, a little bit of ownership of it, and, and now it's become a bit bigger. It's almost like something that you don't really, don't quite want to share because it's your own little thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. I do have that with a lot of shows um, or, you know musicians with this not so much really because i'm just desperate for people to watch it so mm. but i'm so so obsessed that i can't really have like casual viewers so i don't really understand if someone's just flicking onto it i'm like oh let's just sit down and watch the entire series it's like no i'm not that bothered but it's fine i'm like no 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 you have to absolutely love it because if you like the show you love the show mm. um i feel i definitely feel ownership over it but i more want people to watch it and i'm mm. sort of feels I'm just so glad that at some point, I guess, by about halfway through series two, and then by that, that special episode between series two and three, it seemed to just absolutely explode um, and everybody seemed to discover it. So I was thrilled, but by that point I was like, yeah, I've been saying this for a year and a half. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. if we had to nail you down to a series then, which series would you say is your favourite? Um... Possibly one, no, two. We'll go two. <laughs> okay. I think. <laughs> go on, then I'm going to ask why. Well, I guess by two, they'd establish the characters enough to be able to uh, really seed the emotional depth to it. So I don't necessarily think that you might watch a casual episode and realise just how... Um, what's the word, insightful it is about human nature and things like loneliness and youth and um, friendship, I suppose. But, um, but, the, but, you know, if you watch the whole thing and you look back, you realise that, you, you know, they were sort of fun, they're all funny characters that you laughed at in that first series. Um, but by the second, you just saw such tragedy. You saw all their desires much more clearly. Um, there was a lot more sadness to it i mean it was still really funny but i just think that it like elevated itself beyond mm. that beyond a really funny mockumentary which it is by the second series it just became so heartbreaking as well mm. Mm. and if you've got a particular character that you sort of lean towards as your favorite or um no I, well i feel well my opinion is that kerry and curtain can't not be your favorites but also they are the same because they are kind of hold each other up they are such mm. a perfect balance that i don't i couldn't pick one over the other but then peripheral characters um i really like um uh what's his face the vicar's son what's his uh, name jacob. Jacob. jacob yeah jacob, yeah because um perhaps less so for the character well the character's good it's a, and it's a good performance but more just because of the element that by bringing him in, you got to see a different side of the vicar, and you got to see a different side of Kurt, this sort of protective, brothery type, um, trying to control him when he'd taken a pill was just hysterically funny when they're going on that fishing trip. Um, so yeah, I, I, of, of, the, of the, the outsider characters, it would be him, I think. Mm. Yeah. It's, all, it's also that that. Oh no, Mandy! I totally <laughs> like Mandy. Oh, big Mandy! Him. Sorry, but anyway, sorry to interrupt. No, no. Doesn't no. she scare you at all, Sarah? 
Um, well, because we always <laughs> said we everybody knows a big Mandy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think there are a load of, loads of big Mandy's at my school, but then I kind of think that's why everybody loves it because she's based on a girl from their school, right? And um, I think everybody yeah. probably relates to this because they're probably still... Like, if I saw some of the girls from my school, like, on my block, I'd probably cross the road. But um, I think that's probably why everyone finds her so funny. But also because she's so ridiculous that you just wonder, like, why was I scared of this local person who just like does tattoos and collects compare me near cat toys and like what else, what else does she do i don't know i think that that obviously the the book club episode is hysterical but then um the <laughs> i was just watching the one where she admits to stalking hannah spirit <laughs> it just kills me because it, again it's just so strange um and unthreatening like it's so odd anyway i think um i don't i don't know whether i'd be scared of her but it's the strangeness that i sort of love yeah i think that's the bit that that is scary for me is that strangeness is that she looks like calm but it also looks like in a split second she would change and rip your head off and there's you wouldn't know it was coming <laughs> yeah. she, she wouldn't be like, <laughs> no, and then she all effing and blinding and she'd just attack you and you wouldn't know anything about it until it was too late yeah, <laughs> or, or like probably with uh, what are they call those nunchucks. The nunchucks. Yeah. Range. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just want to leave her like, I, just let her fall asleep with her eyes open. That would be, uh, I'd be quite happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Do you find yourself using um, some of the uh, quotes from this country in your day to day life? Yeah, all the all the time. It's too easy to do. I think I do that generally with like tv all the time i think i'm a lot of people do that i think i do it a lot i forget mm. that words have come from tv but um yeah i this country slipped in so much that I, I forget that other people don't actually know what i'm quoting but does that so that does that make it nicer when you do it or do you want someone to go oh i know it, i know that i know what you mean um good question I, I expect that they do know. <laughs> yeah. It never occurs to me that they don't until now. But now that I think about it, like slipping into a West Country accent actually probably is just like <laughs> something that other people have just accepted that I do without me actually realising that it's quite strange. I, that I, have no idea what I'm talking I about. had it. I had it last week. Somebody at work had a bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwich, and I went up to them and went tomato like that, and they just looked at me <laughs> like I'd spat on their food. They had they had no idea. <laughs> what if I, in fact, I said it's from a TV show. It's um, it's a funny show. Maybe you should watch it. It's really good. And they just sort of slunk out of the room because I was really embarrassed. No, he didn't. Had no idea. So some people, you know, you have to be careful who you do it to. I think. Yeah, I think you do. Mm. <laughs> so what ones do you use, Sarah? Um, let me have a think. Uh, what's the I definitely use I've got me range like all the time, but I don't really know what it's reference referencing. Um, uh, what the actual fuck curtain, obviously. Mm. Um, also, just generally, if I'm just saying what the fuck, I'll just be like do that. But you know, she does that slow thing like mm. what the. F <laughs> anyway, I just think it's slipped in. But other people just think I've slowed down. Um, I, yeah. I was going to say, I was gonna say you do a very good uh, West Country accent. Yeah, you do. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Well, I don't really realise do. I'm doing it. That's I the thing just, that makes yeah. me laugh is you don't just do the quote, but you do the quote in a West Country accent, which I think is really, really good. I, think yeah, I don't think I realise I'm doing that sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> do you have any connection to the West Country to get it that no. good, or is it just mimicking? No, I don't. I don't know if I've ever been there. Well, uh, yeah, I've never been. Wait, what? The, what constitutes the West? Well, like the, Bristol. The, the, yeah, the Cotswolds. No. 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 You've never been to Bristol. It must be a past life. No, where have I got this from? It must wow. be a past life, I think. Then, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. That's okay. Yeah. That's that's very good. It's very hard to do accents, as we <laughs> as we found out many times trying to do things on radio. It's very hard to do accents. Very. <laughs> Um, right, we will talk a little bit more about this country, but let's uh, let's just talk a little bit about um, yourself. So, how did you how did you get into the industry that you're in? How did you uh, what did you decide to do that for? 
Oh, um, well, I just, well, I always wanted to do it and didn't do much about it. I always liked writing and obviously, so I would cover, uh, what I cover at work is things like music, film, TV, mostly books. Um, so the fun stuff, obviously mm. that's a dream job being able to write about those. Um, and I, yeah, I, I always liked the idea, didn't do much about it. And then just uh, a couple of years after I'd finished uni, applied for an internship at the Telegraph and then got it. And then from then <laughs> clung on for dear life <laughs> whenever anyone gave me any kind of work. Um, and yeah, now I've been at the Eye for about two years. I think I was at Radio Times before that for three years. So a lot of TV. Mm. How, how many sort of programs once you're having to in your review mode how many programs a week do you actually have to watch well that really varies so at the moment i just am doing a weekly tv column so i'll usually watch either you know the re- the, sh- the program to review or perhaps multiple episodes or like multiple episodes of some whatever theme i'm writing about that week I'll, it kind of it really varies if you're doing a TV column, so like in the daily newspaper, you do two reviews, it's two shows. And then if you kind of, sorry, this is really boring, isn't it? I'm just No, it's fascinating. No, no, carry on, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, and then I guess if you're doing a few, what I could have just said, it's probably about three, three shows a week, maybe? The reason I ask... Well, sorry, Sarah, the reason I asked was because, you know, with now with the likes of Netflix and things like that and their TV shows, everything mm-hmm. drops at once. So it's like time, isn't it, to get through and watch the whole show? It is, yeah. I mean, to be honest, it's time anyway. Certain things that I find really easy, not easy to review, enjoyable to review. So comedy is enjoyable to begin with. You don't have to concentrate all that hard at the beginning anyway. And unless it's really you'll have a good time watching it and if you don't you'll probably have a good time writing about it Mm. um but something like drama it's you know you've got an hour to watch it and then you've got to also be really focusing and thinking like oh my god doing like a murder mystery or a period drama i just find really difficult because i can't sustain my it can't sustain my attention enough to notice if something's happening like you know you might pick up your phone and then you've got to start it again so you've got to be quite disciplined weirdly disciplined when you're watching tv to review it because it actually requires way more concentration than if you were just casually watching it um so yeah and as for things like netflix i mean it is it takes a lot of time if you Mm. commit to watching the whole series which to be honest a lot of the time unless i am writing about it in which case you've obviously got to see it but i have to say that i trail off on netflix a lot you know other people will be like oh did you watch did you binge watch this box set i'm thinking no i watched two episodes and i couldn't bear any more of it because Mm. i don't know i don't mean i love tv but just find a lot of a lot of stuff on there is overlong and just tedious like these true crime documentaries i cannot abide most of the time um and a lot of the dramas are just oh i don't know i'm a bit cynical about netflix because even though it's great and it's made loads of my favorite shows i still always now have in back in the back of my head that something has been like algorithmic algorithmically i don't know if that's the word, <laughs> sounds good it sounds good it's been, did, it's been invented by an algorithm to kind of keep me hooked and sometimes I'm happy for that and it works and it's great and others I'm like I don't know just a bit cynical so so how hard is it you said that you love tv how hard is it to separate the job from enjoying tv because if you're watching if you're um, watching something do you do you still be critical of it if it's something that you're enjoying oh yeah but I think I'm just critical by nature anyway. Right. So or at least that's what uh, all my friends and family tell me uh, or complain about. But <laughs> yeah, I, I get in trouble a lot for ruining things that other people like and, you know, thinking my opinion's more important because if if I have decided that I don't rate something I, and other people are talking about it on WhatsApp and maybe I, I might have watched it a couple of weeks early, um, I sort of won't bite... I've, I won't bite my tongue. I'm trying to more now. If someone's enjoying something that I've trashed or that I think is shit, then I am really trying not to spoil other people's enjoyment anymore. Uh, but it is really hard because I don't know. It's not natural to keep your opinions in. I don't think, or at least it's not for me. 
<laughs> Especially when it's your job. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I I still do enjoy TV, but I have to say, no, I enjoy it a lot more now that I'm maybe talking, writing about TV once a week. Whereas, mm. so last year, if I was, I did it about two or three times a week. I found it much harder because you never get the time to watch things that you like because you feel a bit guilty watching TV at work um, because it just feels a bit cheeky. Mm. So then you're watching it in the evenings. You, you, I definitely had a period of time where watching telly was like, I wasn't switching off anymore. But then I, I remember, what was it, the show that changed that? I think it was weirdly the cheer, you know, the cheerleading job on Netflix. That was brilliant. Um, I watched that in like February or something and I was I just was absolutely hooked I watched the entire thing in one sitting and I think that was the first time I felt like oh, I really enjoyed this out of pure enjoyment mm. Mm. do you miss writing about films you said you haven't do you still write film reviews not very often no I mean I think my I definitely am more comfortable with tv because um it just has a bit I like the I like that it's um, in your house, that it's less of an event. I mean, I love the cinema. That, that's got its merits, obviously, mm. the, the event of going to the cinema. And you can kind of consume something in one whole, which I do like. But there's something about TV means that you can kind of get a relationship with the show and an attachment to it. And sometimes a reliance on it. I've definitely been addicted to a lot of TV series that I think, for me at least, definitely um i yeah definitely i'm a bit more um just love it more to be honest mm. what was the last show that you either really loved or really hated that everybody else that you knew had the opposite opinion to you oh that's a good question well you know what i never really understood tiger king i'm sure i'm not the only one but i oh, just okay. i'm the only person that didn't really watch it my friends are all i mean everyone's kind of over it now but in lockdown, I just, I just sort of laughed along, but I had no interest whatsoever. I watched about one episode and I just thought, this is chaos and <laughs> really trash, but mm. not like enjoyable trash, you know? I mean, I am completely obsessed with um, Sam and Billy, The Mummy Diaries on ITVB and Fern McCann, First Time Mum. That is like inoffensive, banal, benevolent trash. But there's something about, you know, Tiger King, which is really bleak. So that was one. I'm trying to think what else there was. If there's been any big dramas or anything lately. Because mm. uh, I was, I was thinking, was Tiger King a thing of that moment? Do you think it's that everybody was in quarantine, everybody was locked down? That was something that sort of at that moment hit. I don't I think if it was any other time, it wouldn't have been as big as it was. Yeah, definitely. I mean, th we have had so many of this type of crime doc, and I think pe they, each of them gets madder and madder, and each of them gets more its own following, and mm. pe their sort of flavour of the month for a while. But something about that one being landing on Netflix when it did and being so kind of out there, definitely. I think it, I think it was a combination of those things. Um, it got very lucky, I would say, but also I think uh, you know. Yeah, it's not it's not a show that anyone's ever going to watch again it's kind of the blessing and the curse is that nobody is i don't think is going to stumble across tiger king in years to come and be like oh well i've just watched this cool documentary series it was it's so everyone watched it then and if you didn't you're never going to watch it now mm. Mm. yeah absolutely well, I, not, anyway. <laughs> I do agree yeah Absolutely. So going back to films then, obviously films and cinemas having a very tough time in this lockdown, but there are films coming out. Has there been any highlights you've seen in that sense? Um, let me think. I'm not actually been very good about going to the cinema. I mean, I think I went once. Um, what did I see? Tenet. Mm. Didn't rate it. Um, it was very but... loud, wasn't it? It was very loud. And I, completely I, yeah, yeah. Um, myself and my wife were watching it at the cinema and we looked at each other about an hour and a half in and said got any idea what's going on and we but no got no idea and we just sort of like just rode out the rest of the whatever it was hour and 10 minutes of the rest of the film it was just mind-bogglingly just 
messy yeah. as far as I'm concerned. That's how I felt after about five minutes. But no, I, was right. like, I was happy to be in a cinema though. Yeah. Um, that felt nice. What else have I seen recently? Do you know what? I've, I've not been great at watching new films. I've been a lot better about revisiting old ones, like just for like the other weekend. I can't remember what I did. What, I can't remember the reason, but I ended up watching like, um, how to, what's it called? How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days, uh, Steel Magnolias, and another kind of 90s rom com in like the space of a day. And I don't know what was going on, but. <laughs> nostalgia, <laughs> nostalgia. Yeah. yeah, it must be. But I mean, I'm not really repping my credentials there. But, oh well. <laughs> <laughs> Do you but, know, um, when you were reviewing films more often, did you ever get sent to see films and you thought, I really don't think I can watch this, like a horror film or one of those sort of? Well, I haven't, to be honest, film is always the thing that I've done the least, but there was one, there was one, let me think what it was called. It starred Robert Patterson. I was supposed to be reviewing it and I just hated it, but I, everybody else completely loved it and I just felt really dense afterwards. Maybe I am dense. I did just tell you that I love these rom-coms. There's no I, harm in that. They're no all harm. good films. Exactly. But um, what was it called? It was some what? freaky film with Robert Pattinson. I'm going to look it, it wasn't, up. It wasn't The Lighthouse, was it? No, it was It was years before that. Um, all right. It was, some, oh, do you know what? it was some kind of European horror that was just really... I'll never find it, but it was about a sort of old king, and I just thought this is unbearable. Can't stand it. <laughs> wow. um, and then I and I, the worst is that you watch them so far in advance that you kind of can't find out what other people thought. So you you say what you think, and then you find out months down the line that everybody else loved it, and you all just didn't understand it, which is humiliating. <laughs> But that uh, doesn't that come with being a, a a critic, if you like? Is like you're putting your head above the parapet a little bit in regards to this is my opinion, this is what I think. Um, have you got to be quite thick-skinned to be a critic, really? Well, I imagine if you're like, I feel I feel like film critics often kind of have a bit more. Um, what's the word? just a bit more influence and people are you can do something quite literary with a film review that I don't feel many people do with a tv review so I think um there's a little bit more boldness in film writing so I would say yes for um film critics tv critics yes um but you know it <laughs> the nature of it is kind of that not every, you're not going to be like Clive James being able to write some fantastic insightful thing every week because you know sometimes you're going to be it's not going to be right for your readers to kind of go delve really deep into like doc martin and write some really you know, like hard-hitting thoughtful nuanced piece about it you kind of just want to find out what happened like in the village that week mm. but not that i've ever reviewed doc martin having said that but <laughs> um but i don't know i guess yes you should be thick-skinned um I suppose probably probably the thicker skin you need to be, perhaps that's the sign that you're a better, braver critic because you're kind of eliciting a bit more of a reaction. Um, I think something that I found with p other people that review, especially TV, is that um, you'll often be looking out for what everybody else gave it. So say you've thought something was brilliant you might give it a four or a five, but then, you know, the, sh the show ends, the other newspapers publish their reviews and they've given it like a two and you just feel really like, oh, you doubt your opinions. You kind of have to fight a bit not to doubt your own opinions when other people have gone another way to you. Mm. Yeah. Do you still like review the reality shows and things? You know, like yeah, you strictly, yes. you love all that. Yeah, well, strictly less so because I I love watching it out of pure enjoyment, and um, I there's I kind of find it hard to write about because well that takes a real skill being able to say something new about a show that is largely the same format year after year. So that one I would say I I don't love writing about it, mm. um, but. I've forgotten the question. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I just, uh, with reality shows, uh, oh. basically, how hard is it to write? You know, they're, they're well, pretty much all the same formula. That's, sorry. So Strictly is a different one. 
most reality shows I love writing about because it's so stupid. Like it used to be so much fun. I used to do um, I'm a Celebrity reviews. That was really fun because there's just something really daft and mad happening all the time. Um, same with Big Brother, um, Love Island. You know, I would say now I wouldn't really ever want to kind of revisit those that much unless there was something, you know, I mean, it, you'd have to really take a fresh angle. Um, but in general, the good thing about reality TV is it's a bit less predictable. Mm. So <laughs> that's a lie. A lot of it is so predictable. <laughs> but a new, sh- you, you, I guess you can kind of pull things out of people a bit but a bit more because they might say something a bit unscripted whereas and and you can sort of be a bit more playful with it you can't really be playful with a um you know a something like line of duty that's a lie line of duty is pretty silly god i'm really (laughs) line of duty i like but you can be playful with it because it is a bit daft sometimes but Mm. a lot of all right you can't really be playful and sarky and funny about like a drama about a missing child or something because it's just not appropriate so it's it's a lot more fun to write about reality where you can be like oh you know that's a big tarantula how's she gonna fit in her mouth or something yeah that's not a great piece of writing but um (laughs) (laughs) and i was gonna ask about the theaters sarah do you do were you uh, able to review many theater things before lockdown well before lockdown sometimes i would mostly do to be honest i we would more commission theater reviews and i'd go to con- concerts really that's what i would review the most mm. apart from tv so theaters at times yes and i love it um but usually i would l- leave that to a theater critic because it's a bit more of a like they have just got so much background knowledge and contextual knowledge that i just um you can feel a bit like an amateur if you don't really know your stuff Mm. whereas i'm a bit more uh i I enjoy music probably more than theater so i review that a lot more and i know a bit more about it um so yeah i mean i really am missing that now i didn't to begin with in lockdown obviously i was gutted that everything closed but i was sort of it can get quite um tiring being out like a couple of nights a week at concerts as great as it is it is fantastic but it is tiring as well and that is something that you really have to fight hard to try to um enjoy when you are writing about it you're standing there in a crowd on your phone trying to kind of get 400 words out quickly on your notes app like it it can be quite um what's the word it can dull the atmosphere a little bit but um, but I'm really missing it now. It's probably mm. the thing that I miss the most, actually, because there's so much for me anyway. There's so much in a concert that's not just about the music; like it's about like a, a sense of collective happiness, freedom. I don't know. There's so many things in a concert, and I just yeah, yeah it's just yeah. not something that I've been able to feel so long. Mm. So, what's your favourite gig you've ever been to? Oh, so. I would say probably um, the David Byrne American Utopia tour a couple of years ago mm-hmm. um, was like the best thing I've ever, ever seen. Oh my God, here's a film you should watch that's out that I watched a couple of weeks ago in lockdown. The, is the film of that, which is just brilliant. I don't know when it's out. I think it might be 11th of December, but um, I've pulled that out the air but i think that's right but the film the spike lee filmed concert of that is unbelievable um and i went to the actual show a couple well i went twice to the show a couple of years ago and it was just the best concert i've been to but also beyonce and lord both fantastic live i think even if you weren't a like super super fan i think those are brilliant and Mm -hmm. dixie chicks because I love <laughs> <laughs> Go on and on. And Taylor Swift, obviously. Obviously. Yeah. Obviously. We all love a bit of Tay Tay. <laughs> well, I, do I, we, do I, we really, all love a bit of. <laughs> a, a 50 year old man should never be saying something like that. That was crazy. I, I, you I, can I, like Tay Tay, I think. I'll tell you what, yeah, I think, you can like her, I think but... there's probably one or two of her songs that I like. I've never really given her a chance. So maybe I should. Uh, <laughs> Maybe. I, I have to say gigs are the one thing i'm really missing i go to a lot of gigs and yeah i'm missing that 
awfully. Um, I was supposed to have gone to the Pearl Jam one in Hyde Park. Been trying to see Pearl Jam since 1992. And every time I've tried to see him, something's happened that I've never been able to. Aww. And so I've got my tickets for next year, but who knows? We'll see. I'm, I'm really hoping that there'll be a way to do outdoor concerts by the summertime. But then will people go? I mean, people did go to some of the few socially distanced concerts socially distanced concerts that happened but it's just really hard isn't it because mm. you, you don't i don't know it's just really sad and it's also um just thinking of how special it is to go to smaller gigs like i, I do i actually really like big gigs but those small ones in tiny mm. tiny venues i mean i do worry that those will be a thing of the past when those venues can't really afford to keep going mm -hmm. um, or to get in enough people spaced out it, yeah, I'm. I do that. That's something that I am worried about in future. Mm. Mm. So how is how is things like say YouTube and Twitter and that? How has that changed your job um, with the fact now that everybody already has an opinion and they don't only have an opinion; they can tell the world what their opinion is. How does that change your job? Um, well, to be honest, since I've been doing it they have always been there. So I've slightly always, I've learned how to do the job with that in my brain. It's like an extra dimension of, um, of being a journalist or to be honest, it's like of being anyone I think now just mm. has, has social media in the back of their mind and like constant onslaught of opinions that it, it, I don't know what it's like to be a journalist where you're the only one that people are listening to. I feel sort of, you're just used to being one of, thousands of voices which is probably quite good in some ways but i do think that um you know it can be a little bit too easy to be led by twitter sometimes but then at the same time you're not you as much as i've had read horrendous things on twitter and i think most of the time it's a pretty bad thing um it, it also does really open my mind at times to, to other people's ideas about TV, which I really, really like. And for a lot of shows, it can really help you to um, get that sense of collective, um, what, I don't know what, what the word would be. You get a bit of unity and co communal enjoyment watching TV and seeing other people's tweets, watching something that you're also watching. I mean, that was back when, a, a couple of years ago, something like Love Island, which, you know, a negative show overall, in my opinion, but wh when it was at its better end, um, one of the best things about watching it was that other people were watching at the same time as you, you all felt kind of together in it. Um, I think, I think that's, I think I do like that. Um, and I also like other people's opinion, like other people's opinions. It makes me think a little bit harder. People don't really give Twitter enough credit for it. Um, you know, opening people's minds a little bit because otherwise you only have your own opinion. You mm. only have the quite samey opinions of most, you know, newspaper journalists. Like, it's great to see what other people think. Yeah. But then again, yeah. you're still just reading Twitter users and that's not, you know, the entire population. So it goes round and round, doesn't it? Mm. Mm. <clears throat> it does. Right, before we carry on, we're going to have a little bit of a quiz. Okay, I'm going to give you a line of dialogue. You need to tell me whether it was Kerry or Curtin that said it. Okay, we have five. So here's number one. I shake people's hands. I'm up for cutting ribbons on, you know, new businesses. Was that Kerry or Curtin? Um, Kerry. It's correct. Well done. That's in the Harvest yeah. episode. Oh, was it? It oh. was, when she's got the uh, Lord of the Harvest hat on. <laughs> Yeah, so that's one out of one. Good start. Number two. Are these all from the third series? These could be from any episode. Yeah, so these will be from all of the series. Number two. Sounds like the best day of my life, to be honest. Oh, um, Curtin. No, it was Kerry. It's Kerry. Is that your final answer? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's definitely Kerry. And do you know Is what episode? About... Is it about the... um? Oh, I don't know, but is it when they go on a flight, her and her dad? That is correct, yes. Because I left the dad bit off because that was going to give it away. Uh, yes, it's Peeping Tom episode when uh, Martin's going to take her to Australia and she's going to be <laughs> Captain Dipstick. Okay, number three. So two out of two, well done. Number three. 
You know how some people feel they were born in the wrong body? Well, they feel like they're born in the wrong century. Ooh, don't know about this one. Uh, we'll go curtain, but it's a guess, probably wrong. That is curtain. That's on the station episode when they see the Tudor people dressed up. Oh, yeah. Well done. Three out of three. Number four. So you want me to lie. What do you think God will think about that? Oh, Carrie. And do you know what episode that is? Uh, yes. It, so let me think what the title is. It's the one where they're playing. Kurt wants to go to TK Maxx and, um, to get the discount stuff when it's no. new in and Carrie like sm what is it she smashes her leg to shreds like a breadstick in a blender tree. yeah that's it <laughs> it is well done minor <laughs> what's, injuries what's the episode called minor injuries that one. Oh, that's it yeah. yeah so that's four out of four so this one for 100 i haven't had 100 percent for a while this one okay. for 100 percent. when you think you're taking it down a notch take it down another four notches please is that Kerry or Kurt <laughs> for 100%, five out of five, I'm not adding the pressure, but five out of five, you need this one. Is it Kerry or Curtain? <laughs> um, oh, I don't know. Let's go Curtain, but I think it's wrong. It is Curtain. Well, is well Curtain. done, Sarah. What, well, what episode that, was that, was, that was the Cynthia episode from series three when Kerry goes over and stays for the night. Yeah. Well yeah. done. Five out of five. <laughs> there you go. That is very good. Very good indeed. The look of relief on your <laughs> face there. Um, right. Um, uh, this week it was announced that the US remake of this country has gone to series. They're going to make 14 episodes in America. Um, how do you feel about the US remake of this country? Um, uh, what do I think of the American series? Um, well, I was not thrilled to begin with. I mean, fair play to, number one, amazing for them to get it sold out there. And I'm pleased about that because it's so nice that it's been recognized. And also I'm sure the comedians that they've, the actors that they've hired, cast, can't work, can't speak tonight. Yeah, I'm sure the actors that they've cast are fab. I think the girl, what's the name of the American version of Carrie? I can't remember. But it's uh, Kelly Shrub. That's it. Yeah, Kelly I, I and... I've... No, sorry, it's Kelly and Shrub Mallet. So it's Kelly Mallet is the name, yeah. <laughs> I think I've seen the girl before on, uh, I don't know what she does, maybe YouTube or something, uh, Twitter clips. So she was really funny. So it's definitely not a mark of kind of the talent of anyone involved, but it's more that I'm always a bit wary that you don't want these things to flop. I mean, I, mm. I remember watching an awful, was it? The Inbetweeners. I think I watched a terrible Inbetweeners remake. Um, but then at the same time, for every kind of, for every show that didn't work, there's The American Office, which was just so brilliant and its own thing completely separate from the yeah. UK office, yeah. which I just think is fab and proof that it can work. Um, because I ended up just absolutely adoring that program and I'm obsessed with the UK office, but I, I just see them, I love them both in their own right. So it can it can um, can work, but I just would hope that the subtlety is kind of still there. I mean, usually subtlety isn't really the word you'd use for Gary and Curtin, but mm -hmm. there's so much in every really carefully chosen word and reference, and obviously it's so firmly rooted to um, British rural life but not really i don't even think that the rural element is the most important bit i think there's so many i, th I think despite that it's very universal so i don't i just think it's very british um that i would hope that whoever is writing it can kind of try to conjure up that same sense of place and nostalgia that the british series has because that is kind of part of its charm for me anyway mm. Mm. Well, it's, it's got a good pedigree behind it. Jenny Bix is um, down as writing it, but I'm assuming they'll have a writer's room. But she did um, Sex in the City and The Greatest Showman and, play, and things like that. And Paul Feig is apparently directing it, who did mm. Bridesmaids and uh, Ghostbusters. Course, yeah. yeah, so, I mean, there's a, there's a, there is a good 
pedigree behind it. I'm, I'm fascinated just to see what it's going to look like and hope that they don't try and make it too like like our like ours if that makes sense you know yeah i think but i reckon by now they're so used to trying this and it going wrong that they want to make sure they are retaining um the what makes it so special and mm. at least trying to translate that um so you know the thing is i might watch it and not like it but that would be perhaps because i don't maybe i wouldn't get it because it's been so specific in its references and it's um location and it's um the kind of manners and um patterns of speech that it tries to kind of recreate which our version does um that it might not even make sense but to someone else watching it would be just brilliant and really unique and you know a bit like this country one of the best things about this country is that you can be watching and hear someone speaking in a way that you just don't hear on scripted tv you hear it in natural natural conversation mm. but you know just even if it's not words it might just be going oh or you know <laughs> kerry going fuck you like Kurt going, fuck you now like mm. little things that just feel a bit like you know they're not very often written into tv but um when you hear them you just think well why not this is how we speak um or you know, yeah, so I really hope that it retains that, and and if it does, perhaps I won't even get, I won't even notice because it won't make sense to me. But that's the sign of a good show, perhaps. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Right, I've got one quick question. If um this country and this can um did a uh, Gavin and Stacey and came back ten years later, where do you think we'd find Kerry and Curtin? Ooh, so um. Well, I feel like Curtin would probably have a nice wife um, and kids. But I think that he'd have, like, his own projects all the time. That Like, maybe he'd be, like, have his own shed and he'd be out there doing some weird stuff. I don't know. That's <laughs> I don't know. Kerry, I feel like, could potentially be, like, a PE teacher at school or something. Or, like, <laughs> or, like very into QAnon or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately i can see yeah. um yeah well i feel like curtain will i, f I feel like kerry probably w might have got like a nice relationship going with her half brothers curtain i think will still be like looking after her most of the time but he's got his own wife um but they don't live too far away my god calm down i'm getting <laughs> but yeah i would like to think that they'd still live close by because mm. um you, you know curtain always wanted to break free and kind of um sow his oats but i think um i think that carrie might uh, i feel like he wouldn't go too far from her because of their kind of that protection that they that he has for her and and she though I don't think she necessarily understands it, is so compassionate towards him and knows everything about him, you know, where she's, she, she'll be worrying about what people will say about his nan or talking to camera about how he gets really very much too obsessed with things. Like, I just think she understands his, all of his idiosyncrasies and he understands why she's quite stupid, mm. <laughs> but really you know what she really wants in her heart and both and both of them um sort of balance each other well but i think um i would like to think that that they wouldn't be too far but equally they wouldn't have you know they, they wouldn't be where they i would hope they're not still in the village i'll say that <laughs> <laughs> okay one final question this is a question that we've sort of asked everybody since series three um curtains nan who do you think it is Oh, I don't know. I tried so hard to work this out. I must have replayed that clip so many times. I've texted everyone I know who's involved in the programme trying to get them to tell me and nobody will. No. Uh, uh, right. So it's a Hollywood person, right? But it's not, um, it's not, I don't necessarily think that means that they're American. Should we tell you who we think it is that the majority of this country fans think that it's Tilda Swinton? 
Oh, I think I've read that somewhere. Yeah, and I think once you, well. once you, once well, we as we've said, once we know that you can't really see anybody else. But is she tall enough? Let me think. When I was replaying that that clip where she, you know, where they blur out her face, is it the brother's yeah. funeral episode? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Um, and she stood on the doorstep. Well, I think I don't know if she's tall enough. Maybe it could be. I could believe someone like. Um, oh, I don't know. But she's hunched. She have... She's hunched over as well when she's when yeah, she's talking. It's hard to tell. I, I I just can't see. And and she was in David Copperfield with with Daisy. Oh my God, that's a really. <sighs> But then Kurt, uh, Kurt, Charlie has done like modeling, so he could have come into contact with all sorts. And then she went to Rada, so it could could be a bloke. Like, what if it's. What, <laughs> what's he called? Well, she, I haven't what, thought of that before. But wasn't was, she at Rada with um, James. Oh, what's his name? James. Oh, yes. Um... How can I have forgotten his but name? But then he's a big build, built guy. I know the guy you mean. Yeah. He's in um, the Happy Valley and all that, wasn't he? Uh, um, Norton. James Norton. But he's quite uh, a big it, built guy, it, isn't he? Curtin's nan was James Norton. I don't <laughs> think it is. Um, well, we'll find, will, will we ever find out? Are they ever going to tell us? Or is it no, just they've like, said oh, they'll never tell us. Yeah, we've spoken, we've spoken to um, the director and the producer and Daisy and Charlie and they've, they will, they keep saying they don't know. They keep saying that it's someone from Australia or someone like that. And so a lot of people thought it might have been Kate Blanchett, but I'm, ad I, I'm adamant that it's Tilda Swinton. Just as soon as you see that. Just... She is British. Uh, yeah. Maybe it's someone like, um, um, I don't know why now I'm just thinking of Australian people because you said Kate <laughs> <laughs> Nicole Kidman. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Maybe it is, but she's tall as well. So I don't know. Um, Oh, like Pav said, hot. she's very hunched when she comes out the door, isn't she? She's scrunched up. Yeah. 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 What if it's like Julia Roberts or someone really rogue? <laughs> oh, that'd be good. I mean, that would be good. Yeah. I, I don't think we will ever know. I'm pretty sure it's the thing that they, that whoever the actress is has said, look, don't ever say who it is. It's just something I'll come and do for a morning and just don't te ever tell anybody. But you know what we should do is send someone out to the village and find out, you know, someone must have noticed at some point that there was a Hollywood A-lister in that tiny well, village. Where we only live, we live a few miles away from the village. So oh, there's no reason. Yeah, we might do that one Saturday morning. We might do that as a thing for our Patreon, Neil, and get, take a, a camera. <laughs> a right door there. to door. <laughs> yeah. When we're allowed to. On the search for Curtin's nan, we should do that <laughs> and see if we can get somebody, get to the bottom of it. There'll be somebody there. Someone must know. It'll be one of these like local, lo like what is it that um, Kerry says about her dad that he he wrote down, he wrote um, Wonderwall on a beer yes. mat and then Ross <laughs> picked it up and chucked it away and then always, uh, exactly. maybe it'll be something like that, you know, yeah. someone sniffing around and it didn't occur to anyone to, um, maybe it was Hannah Spirit. <laughs> no, that would be now. funny. <laughs> that would be good. <laughs> that would be good. That would that fit would perfectly. Uh, Sarah, thank you so much for spending some time with us. It's been oh, a real thank you. pleasure. Yeah, real it's gone very quick. Yeah, it really yes. has. Um, good luck with the rest of your. Let's hope that there's going to be cinema and movies and music and concerts very very soon that you can go and uh, give us your opinion on uh, yeah, god that's... please let there be all that stuff let's get back to normal <laughs> please yeah. um but thank you ever so much um and for having me. it's been great it's wonderful thank you. neil do you want to do your little bits and pieces absolutely you can find us on all the social media sites under this country pod please do come and click give us a like or whatever it is you may do there you can email us with any questions or anything you'd like to know at wtaf this country at hotmail.com plus we have a website that has everything links to the podcast and all sorts of gubbins especially tickets to our last live show hopefully in may next year at wtaf podcast dot com well done that didn't look very you weren't sure about that then were you i had to have a look down <laughs> on my notes didn't i <laughs> uh, and also come and be a patreon peeper we have uh, a new level for three pounds you could be a lethal peeper uh, just go to uh, patreon.com forward slash wtaf uh, that's it thank you once again sarah thank you very much thank you sarah thank awesome. you very much neil thank you very much pav thank you very much everybody and go and get plumbed you fuckers Scarecrow Festival is like the most important day of the year. Sarah! Oh! Dad, 
daft cow. This is just ridiculous. What the actual fuck?